So I'm suggesting that, for me at least, the pedagogical methodologies are still evolving. Now, could you think of an example of lifeline learning? Same trick as a few minutes ago. Think of an example of lifeline learning assessed or otherwise. And ask yourself, tell, check quickly and tell a neighbor, do these characteristics apply to your example? That's my list. Which of these apply in an example that you're quite pleased with or would like to see happen? Four minutes on that one. I had a colleague who was left-handed, and the world isn't made for left-handed people. All sorts of things from potato peelers to handwriting. And Peter Jackson uh, wasn't really a very good handwriter. And, and one day he was, it was in the days when we had blackboards and we were allowed to call them blackboards. Um, and, and he was writing on the blackboard, and I don't know what writing with chalk on a blackboard does to your handwriting, but it made his handwriting worse. And he was in a hurry, so he was frantically writing on the blackboard, and one by one his students just put their pens down and folded their arms and gave up. And then from the back of the class there came a quiet, reflective Glaswegian voice, if there could, if there could be such a thing, <laughs> which asked, Mr. Jackson, have you ever considered that maybe you're right-handed after all? <laughs> Well, I'm suggesting to you now that maybe when we look at life like learning, we want to wonder if it's as radical as changing hands. Best practice nowadays then was like this. And notice the order in which things happen. We tend to start from the learning outcomes. Me, I would design the assessment so that it was compatible with the learning outcomes. And the assessment through as the hidden curriculum would drive learning and teaching as would the formal statement of learning outcomes. And that's the status quo. Life-wide learning, I suggest to you, is quite different if we try to use the same diagram. It begins from experiences. Within these experiences, people develop. And having developed in the experience, they make an objective record of their development. And so reflective analysis features very powerfully in all of this, and then the development gets linked up with the ROD eventually. So I'm suggesting to you that there are radical differences which all call for change, not for amendments, but for change. For instance, traditional courses we plan for outcomes that we've chosen. Lifewide learning, we plan for an experience which is potentially valuable. Traditional courses, we have intended outcomes. Lifewide learning, the achievements emerge, and I'm indebted to Norman for the idea to call it achievements and not outcomes. Traditional learning, we choose an activity which hopefully is going to help the learners to achieve the outcomes. Life-wide learning, there can be various reasons for choice, including I need the money, uh, or I, I'm, I'm dragged into it, or whatever. Traditional learning, the outcomes and the criteria are general, and in life-wide learning, the out achievements and the criteria are very particular to the person concerned. Each of the students in the Surrey Award have got different achievements to claim and different criteria, appropriate criteria, with which they judge them. The traditional setting, the assessment scheme is by the teachers, and in life-wide learning, I hope the learners identify and claim their own development. So the traditional course is one where there's a lot of external judgment. Life-wide learning, self-knowledge is central. The traditional course, the level, as we march up through FHEQ, is predetermined. Whereas in life-wide learning, the learning emerges. It may be a little higher or a little lower than one might have hoped, but it's appropriate <coughs> to the learning and development that happened in the experience. In the traditional setup, teachers are directive. In life-wide learning, I hope teachers are supportive and facilitative. And maybe in the traditional setup, we, we do also have facilitative teachers, but, but they are directive in the sense of choosing the outcomes, choosing the assessment, choosing the plan, choosing the timing. So it seems to me that we surely need a new and not a revised or adaptive pedagogy. 
Let's put the learning experience at the middle of this diagram. And uh, Norman assures me that for those of you who want these slides, they'll be uh, on the website. They're also <coughs> slightly different from the paper that's in the booklet and, and slightly different from the earlier versions of these slides. Uh, we, we, we've got to decide that somehow this experience is assessed and hopefully, if it's part of a program of education, that there, is, there are aims and a program, and the tutor has a purpose. And hopefully, there will be, on the left-hand side, a definition of the roles of tutors on assessing people and students. And on the right-hand side, there will be tasks and criteria. I'm suggesting to you, and Panis Lachopoulos has a table napkin from an Edinburgh restaurant in which we first plotted out this diagram, that we, we need to ring fence the learning activity and the experience. We need to ring fence it so that it's separated from the things that happen outside. We, we need to have an input from the tutor's purpose. We need to have an input from the role definitions on the left. We have an input of tasks and criteria, suggestions that people might do, that they might engage in reflection. And we have an output which begins with the students inside the ring fence and then heads out towards assessment. Within the ring fence, hopefully, we have a facilitative tutor or tutors. Within the ring fence, <coughs> the thing that defines that area is that the students have autonomy within that area. They have freedom to pursue their experience and their choices and their development. And within that ring fence, there are going to be a lot of serendipitous or chance developments which turn out to be nuggets for the people concerned. And so heading into assessment, the students reflect on the development which has happened. That would be my picture of the kind of pedagogy that I would be aiming for in life-wide learning. Not quite. Uh, sometimes, thinking about project-oriented, problem-based learning, sometimes the students will want access to particular tuition, to a specialism which they don't have, and which is going to be difficult to obtain on the net or elsewhere. So they may decide to go outside the ring fence to get someone to explain something or tell them. And then we go, decide to go outside the, the ring fence to get help with tools of inquiry or with how to use SPSS or whatever it is. But, but these will be aspects of activity outside the ring fence which will not influence what happens inside it except insofar as the students carry that back in with them. Of course, all of this is set in an environment where you've got the internet, libraries, prior experiences and so on. So what's my suggested pedagogy for life-wide learning? Here's a suggestion uh, which contains elements, all of which I've used, but not necessarily all together. First of all, I suggest that the teachers structure a program and then prepare only to facilitate. I suggest that learners without an apostrophe should be free to choose, they should be free to choose aims, activity, and criteria but it should be pointed out to them that they have that freedom and, and they should engage with it. The learners will discuss examples of past outcomes and claims. I find this very useful to show learners the kind of things that other learners have done and say this will give you an idea of the range, the possibilities, the variety, uh, the different levels, the different types of activity that other lifelong learners have engaged in. The learners then make a free choice of an area of life-wide learning activity. They're encouraged to collect and analyze their data, whether it's in a shoebox or an electronic shoebox, or in a way that suits them, in a scrapbook or whatever it is. The reflections should be facilitated, preferably by peers. Uh, and, and facilitated <coughs> reflection is a very powerful thing because the other person may think of questions that you haven't asked. The other person may have another experience to add to your experience, which helps to enrich the generalization. So hopefully, the learners will have planned formative peer interaction 
as we head towards that arrow that takes them out towards assessment. So they collate and analyze their data against their criteria. Their reflective review concentrates on the standards. What is the value of this development which has happened for you? And you claim the development summatively as a claim backed up by evidence and the values against which you've judged it. And that claim can be audited by peers. Now, I don't know how low down the age groups this can go, but 30 years ago, I had claims audited by first year engineering students. And, and the first year Scottish engineering student has, has got what we would tend to call a high cooty dumpling coefficient. And they're, they're, they're pretty stodgy when it gets, when, when you're trying to get them to do something new. So if, if I could get claims for uh, reflective development audited by first year engineers, I, I suspect it's possible for any other students represented in this room. And I would like to see students making an iterative forward plan. Uh, remember, this is part of, uh, part of the educational program, and so I want them to make a forward plan. We used to have students uh, in UHI where nobody really knew what a university degree was to be like, so to some extent we invented our own. And we had students who worked on group projects in semester one in the third year. That's the Scottish Ordinary Degree, penultimate year for you. And at the end, they had to identify the abilities they wanted to develop when they did their group project, as well as what the group project challenged them to do. And at the end of semester one, they identified how much they had developed, and they wrote advice and aspirations to themselves for semester two, when they were going to be doing an individual project. And we warned them when they did that, that at the end of semester two, we would say, okay, how well did you deliver on your advice to yourself for semester two. What did you change and why? What was successful and what was unsuccessful and why? I was trying to develop this business of being, uh, the habit of being a rolling forward learning <coughs> and developing person. That's what I would do in a course in the midst of life like learning. I, I've only done it sometimes with first year engineers. Most of the bits and pieces seem to work. So here in my assertions to prompt a third buzzing discussion, which I thought was going to be over coffee, but I see we're going to go somewhere at uh, 11 o'clock. So let me try these uh, assertions. First of all, life-wide learning is radically different. And I'm suggesting that it needs a new pedagogy, which will be centered on purposeful and reflective decisions by learners. I'm suggesting that most life-wide learners require assistance to learn how to judge. The, the most demanding ability, where, wherever you put it in Bloom's taxonomy, as we shift it about from top to second top, the most demanding ability is the ability to make objective judgments. And we, we go through life having to make objective judgments. We pull down a whole lot of sources from the internet, and we have to decide which ones are worth following and which ones are not worth following. My nine-year-old granddaughter is having to develop